So hello everyone and thank you for giving me the opportunity to present my research on toxic colors at this workshop. I'm Amelie Bonny and I'm a doctoral student in history of science, medicine and technology at uh, the University of Oxford where I work on uh, the construction of expert knowledge on toxic colors and how that interfered with debates on occupational disease and environmental pollution both in France and Britain roughly between 1830 and 1914. So today I'm going to show how conflicting narratives on the properties of aniline purple developed in the scientific community and in the public sphere in France and Britain between 1856 when aniline purple was first discovered and 1914. I'm going to provide some explanations as to what motivated these competing narratives and why one triumphed over the other. And to do this, I will focus first on a narrative that presented aniline purple as an emblem of scientific progress, and then I will show that this idea was challenged by another narrative that stressed the environmental and medical hazards that the production and use of aniline colors posed. So, movein, which is also known as aniline purple, was the first synthetic organic dye, and it was discovered in 1856 when a young British chemist called William Perkin discovered that it could be made with aniline as he was trying to synthesize quinine for the treatment of malaria. Perkin quickly managed to make movein profitable within his own dye works at Greenford Green in the suburbs of London. And the color became widely used in other businesses such as in Manchester, where the samples that you can see here uh, were produced by color chemists who were trying to study the chemical properties of the dyes and its applications. However, one major problem that arose was that movein uh, and other aniline colors started to be used on a, um, scale, uh, on a large scale within an industrial setting before Perkin and other chemists had developed accurate knowledge of its properties. So when aniline purple was first invented in 1856, the initial narrative that developed within the scientific community was one that described the discovery of aniline uh, as a miracle of science. And this narrative persisted for much of the 19th century and even after. So the reason for this enthusiasm was that aniline was made with coal tar, which was considered as waste and as a nuisance. So the production of movein and other aniline colors therefore turned this waste substance into a beautiful color which could be made profitable and which also encouraged industrial growth. So one of the um, advocates of aniline dyes was Peter Lund Simons, who's mainly known for his interest in the recycling of waste substances and his work on waste products and undeveloped substances. So he viewed aniline um, as a manifestation of the undeveloped wealth of nature and used the case of aniline to argue that most waste products could be made commercially profitable through science. This view is also shared by physician Andrew Winter, who's good here. He was a specialist for popularizing scientific information for a lay audience. And uh, in his article from 1876 that's entitled The Use of Waste Substances, um, he used a quite literary style with numerous metaphors and personifications to portray coal tar as a prodigious a uh, new uh, scientific invention that would be able to solve all the problems of the gas industry by turning uh, coal tar, the offensive refuse, this poor rejected Cinderella into what he called a queen of the byproducts. This quote. He even went as far as comparing the process to magic and to alchemy when using the word uh, transmutation. The engineer Thomas Greenwood also advocated for developing methods to reuse waste in all branches of commerce. And in 1886, he pointed out that coal tar had been a terrible problem that Perkins' invention had largely solved. So through this emphasis on the regeneration of waste products thanks to science, these members of the scientific community, among others, created a lasting narrative that promoted the general idea that science could solve pollution issues in general, making waste profitable and even aesthetically pleasing. In this way, we see that late 19th century discourses on what we now call recycling practices are actually more ambiguous than what we might first think, because they actually contributed to further promoting polluting industries. In this case of uh, aniline purple, the portrayals of aniline popularized a form of knowledge 
that was based on the assumption that the economy of nature was circular and that all forms of waste can be eternally regenerated and rendered useful. So this first narrative, um, however, excludes the existence of long-term pollution and of chronic forms of disease caused by the working environment. So this leads me to um, another narrative. At the same time, medical men interested in the health of workers d developed an alternative uh, approach. So one example is the doctoral thesis of a young French doctor called Pierre Charvet, who studied the effects of the red aniline dye vaccine on the human body. So Charvet started his investigations in 1862 when 15 residents who lived next to an aniline business called Renard Frère and Franc in Lyon developed poisoning symptoms, leading to the death of three of these people. So there was an inquiry on the causes of this epidemic which involved members of the local government as well as judicial experts, but they claimed that the industry was not the cause of the disease. And they did not publish the reports of the medical experts they had initially commissioned. And instead, they argued that the symptoms were caused by an epidemic of unknown origin. So in the title of his thesis, Charvet reused the word epidemic, but proceeded to demonstrate that the working environment was the main cause of this epidemic and also for disease of the local population. So in this way, he challenged the findings of local authorities. He demonstrated that arsenic was used in the production process and caused poisoning symptoms such as skin rashes, digestive ailments, as well as impairment of nervous functions, which could also lead to death. Even though the animaline epidemic, as well as Charvet's findings, were widely reported on in both France and Britain, other cases of workplace accidents and environmental poisoning followed, as for example in 1864, when a family who lived next to the same business died. On that occasion, further investigations showed that arsenical waste had been buried around the factory and even dumped into the nearby river. So this case further shows that those medical men who tried to tell the story of occupational disease were often silenced by government authorities until a wider portion of the population was affected and until it became a broader public health issue. And I could add too that in the case of aniline, this was partly motivated by the fact that aniline colors were largely viewed as a safer alternative to colors made with arsenic or lead. Now, debates on the properties of aniline continued in the press, as businesses using aniline colors advertised them, uh, as you can see here, with Holiday & Co. And um, the color also became particularly fashionable after Queen Victoria and the French Empress Eugenie started to wear purple dresses. But at the same time, the press also became a platform for those customers who were negatively affected by the color. And so complaints about poisonous socks, hats, gloves, and others soon appeared both in the French and in the British press, thus challenging the initial narrative of aniline as a wonderful discovery that could solve environmental and sanitary problems. However, overall aniline continued to be praised as a wonderful invention, largely because in the 1880s it started to be used as a tool in the laboratory to stain bacteria as part uh, of Robert Koch and Paul Ehrlich's research. So um, yeah, overall the narrative remained uh, celebratory. It's interesting to add that cases of poisoning have continued well until the 20th century. For example, in 1950, there was an epidemic of newborn babies poisoned by aniline diapers in Birmingham. And in 1981, uh, rapeseed oil containing an aniline led to the death of over 100 people in Spain, which made it necessary to write, uh, rewrite the story of aniline colors. So through this short presentation on the conflicting narratives that developed around the properties of aniline, I've tried to show how issues of occupational disease and un environmental hazards can be easily minimized as one narrative triumphs over the other. While cases of accidents were reported, aniline continued to be seen as a safer color when compared to arsenic or lead colors, and the narrative of aniline as a wonder of science therefore largely overshadows 
the negative effects of aniline production. So if you want to find out more about conflicting narratives on the environmental and sanitary impact of toxic colors, please feel free to have a look at my poster on arsenic green tonight. And otherwise, uh, you can also listen to my podcast on um, a toxic bookcase by, owned by William Burgess uh, at this uh, link here. And uh, feel free to email me with any questions. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>